viajeros, bienvenidos a Mochilazo. Estamos en la destilería de Jack Daniels en Lynchburg, Tennessee. Es una hora, una hora y media al sur de Nashville. Y estamos aquí porque vamos a tomar el mejor tour que tiene Jack Daniels, Angels Share Tour. Estamos por comenzar, vamos a tener una prueba de las mejores etiquetas que tiene Jack Daniels y vamos también a ver cómo lo hacen. Les recomiendo que vayan a ver el video de todo sobre el whisky, aquí está el link arriba, para que lleguen aquí con toda la información de lo que es el American Whisky. drop of jack production in the world so it goes from here to 170 countries worldwide these days and so we'll talk more about that in a minute but uh, my name is ben if you need me it's up here if you forget my name it's okay because we just met we're the sec second smallest county in tennessee so it's about 130 square miles and you've got more county as farms jack and downtown lynchburg So you're gonna see these in commercials and magazine photos. Seven stories tall with about 20,000 barrels of Jack Daniels sitting in there. Some of it could be a day old, some of it could be five or six years old or even longer. Uh, we do it to taste, not time. So the whiskey comes out when it tastes right and looks right. And most of that's typically about five or six years old, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but we've got 92 barrel houses now, all within about a six mile radius of where we're standing. And they, some of them look like this, but the majority of them are four stories tall with 40,000 barrels. All the newest ones are three stories tall and hold about 65,000 barrels a piece. But 92 barrel houses all around Moore County, Tennessee, working the, working the whiskey. So inside a barrel house, there's no climate control, there's no insulation. The temperatures in there are based on Mother Nature. So it's a giant sheet metal barn. So during the summertime, it gets hot and that's going to expand the wood of the barrel. During the wintertime, it gets cold, it's going to contract the wood of the barrel. So summertime, whiskey goes in the wood, trying to get, a, get out of it, really trying to escape. And then during the wintertime, it's going to close that wood and push that whiskey back into the barrel amongst itself. So from toasting the wood, it's kind of like a superheating baking process, and then also charring the wood where you actually burn the inside to caramelize the sugars, we get all our color and most of our flavor from what happens in a barrel. So your barrel is really considered your number one ingredient. And then also that chunk of time, the biggest chunk of time of whiskey making there is really. So we put a lot into the way the barrel works. We actually make our own. Uh, we're the only major spirits group in the world that makes its own barrels to make its own products. We basically look, barrel, uh, look at barrels like a tea bag. So if you try to steep tea more than once, you're not gonna get the same tea. If you try to brew coffee more than once, you're not gonna get, get the same coffee. If you try to use a barrel more than once, you're not gonna get the same whiskey. So we say, well, new barrel every time, American white oak and one-time use, that's gonna become a standard. So that's a standard of practice of a bourbon whiskey and a Tennessee whiskey maker. And then we sell all our barrels to other people to use them. Most of them go to one place. Does anybody know who buys most of Jack barrels? Okay. No, but you're on the right track. Uh, Ron Medellin. Yeah, Ron yeah, Glen Ranji, the Scotch. Yeah. They buy quite a few, but they're not the only Scotch buying them. So Scotch whiskey in general buys most of them. 80% uh, of Jack Daniels barrels become Scotch whiskey barrels. Actually, uh, nine out of 10 Scotch whiskey barrels are old bourbon and Tennessee whiskey barrels. So most of them go into Scotland, but then the other 20% or so go into Irish whiskeys, tequilas, rums, wines, ciders, beers. So a lot of different alcohol beverage creation. And then also outside of alcohol, you've got uh, a lot of uh, uh, other uses like a uh, grilling product. You can they make wood chips and smoking blocks out of them for smoking and grilling. Uh, Tabasco sauce at Louisiana, McElhaney, they use quite a few in their, in their production as well. And then kind of way down the list, most of our barrels don't go this way, but a lot, a uh, few of them do, and they make wonderful things, decorative stuff. So the stuff like at the barrel shop downtown, the furniture, the stools, the bars, the planters, the tables, everything like that. So you can sell them that way too. Some people just like to buy a barrel that's kind of been finished as a display and then put it in their house. And a mash bill is what a whiskey maker calls its recipe. 
So up until uh, recently, we only had one mash bill. It was 80% corn, 12% malted barley, and 8% rye, and that made almost everything uh, until the rye whiskey came along. And now we have one that's 70% rye, 18% corn, and 12% malted barley. But 99.9% .9 of Jack, basically all of it, because we're barely making any rye, it's coming off the same exact base. So same thing until it, until it hits a barrel. Then once it hits a barrel, it starts to change. We'll talk more about that later on. And then after the barrel, you add steps and you make other things out of it from there and you can put that on the shelf. So from really one mash bill, we make a lot of products. Uh, Jack now has around probably 15 or so different products that come off the same mash bill. You just develop it differently. So everything we make, the rye whiskey included, goes through what's called charcoal mellowing. And charcoal mellowing is often kind of misunderstood because we use sugar maple, the same kind of tree to make maple syrup as the tree we use to make the charcoal for sugar maple mellowing. So a lot of folks think that sugar maple is going to ha add some sort of sweetness to it. They think it's also maybe going to be smoky or woody because we make charcoal out of the sugar maple and people picture barbecues and grills. They don't picture activated carbon. But what we're making out of the sugar maple is a giant antique Brita filter, but we don't filter wa water through it, we filter moonshine through it. So all its job is, is not to add flavor, it's to extract corn oils and fatty acids, and that's going to change the flavor, it's just not going to add anything to it at all. You make whiskey with what you got, and when you're going to use a activated carbon filter, you use the wood that you got around that works, for the, works best for that. So that visual there, that'll get you the idea of what the burn looks like to actually make the charcoal. It's an open air burn, it's all man done. But we only do it when we need to do it, which on average is about one burn a day, three or four days a week. I've had a guy here 20 times that's never seen this in person, so this is the norm. We finally made a video. I'd say one for five is kind of your average. So it's open air, just like a bonfire. It takes a lot of skill, even though in some ways it seems simple, it's extremely difficult. It's honestly probably the hardest way to make charcoal there is, but Jack did it this way, so we do it this way. And Darren and Tracy, on the walls in these photos, they are the two guys that do it. They are really the only two men that full-time basis. So if you drank Jack off any shelf in the entire world selling Jack Daniels, you drank whiskey in the past 15 years, you drank whiskey that went through charcoal these two guys made. Wrap your head around that. So they do all charcoal. They make it, they mill it, because we want a smaller size to work with from what we get from the burn. You have a souvenir you might not want. So no smell, but uh, this right here is a kind of the average size of what you get from the burn typically about the size of a marble to a ping pong ball. So you take this piece and you crush it down to this stuff over here because this works better. It increases the surface area. So later, when we see the charcoal doing its job, we'll be seeing this size 10 feet deep and a 14 foot tall bat. So we'll save some of that for later on. Standard, except for the charcoal. That's the one reason we don't use the same name. Yeah, that's the difference. So two good phrases to have in your head, Tennessee whiskey is born from a bourbon whiskey because we have to meet their standards to meet our own. If we don't meet the bourbon standard, we can't be a Tennessee whiskey maker. Uh, but then I also started saying a few months ago, bourbon by nature, Tennessee whiskey by choice. Because a lot of folks kind of word it uh, a little bit incorrectly. They'll say, y'all cannot call yourselves bourbon. We say, no, you don't understand. We can, we're supposed to, we choose not to. And it's not because we're better than bourbon, but we're different than bourbon. Uh, Tennessee whiskey uses the sugar maple charcoal filter, bourbon whiskey does not. And it's also a very distinctive uh, place we use it in production after distillation before the barrel. Because there's actually a lot of bourbon whiskey that uses some sort of charcoal mellowing system but it's after the barrel or even possibly they'll put charcoal in the barrel and do it that way. Because any good whiskey maker wants to refine or filter their whiskey out with the corn oils and fatty acids. But also the inside of a barrel is charred. So what most whiskey makers do is they don't bother using the charcoal filter because it adds work and adds expense. They're going to use something that's already built into making whiskey. So if you're making whiskey, whether it be a bourbon, a scotch, an Irish, a Canadian, uh, it's really three things by ne definition. You ferment a cereal grain, you distill it to a spirit, you put that into a wooden cask. So if you do those three steps, you just made whiskey of some nature, depending on what kind of grains you use and stuff, it's going to change it. Uh, but with the whole charcoal thing, that's the one step that's not part of the definition of making a whiskey. So the, most whiskey makers look at it as extra, and Jack actually looked at it as extra. He called it an extra blessing, so he looked at it in a positive way. But it's a step that refines and mellows and filters the whiskey more efficiently than the barrel can, because the barrel takes two years to filter what we can filter in two days. So that's where the big difference comes in. If we can put the whiskey into a barrel, 
uh, already refined or filtered and mellowed, you've already gotten the corn oils and fatty acids out, you're going to jump start your barrel process by about two years. So we can take our whiskey out of a barrel typically within about five to seven years. But if we did not do the charcoal method, we would have to leave it in there for about seven to nine years to mellow it properly. So we're giving you a whiskey that kind of bridged the gap. And so can't say better, but very unique, very unique. Most whiskey makers don't want to bother with the charcoal because it adds so much to the process. But we like it because you're not going to get that character without it. So with that, we said, well, everything gets it once. Some things get it twice. But there's only six or seven Tennessee whiskeys that are that, that produce. So there's only six or seven whiskeys in the world that use that specific sugar maple charcoal filter after distillation before the barrel. And uh, we're called Tennessee whiskey because that process was originated in Tennessee. Nobody knows, excuse me, nobody knows exactly who started doing it first. But Lincoln County, Tennessee, where this used to be, Lynchburg as well, uh, gets credit with coming up with it. So they said, well, we'll call this the Lincoln County process. Then eventually they said, well, we'll call that Tennessee whiskey making. But the reason we chose this to be our home is because the water coming out of that cave. So this is a cave spring system. It's iron free because of the limestone. Limestone is the synonymous thing to really whiskey making location. If you start opening a map of American whiskey production, you're gonna notice it's limestone rich environment because that water source is going to be the, really affected by the limestone. It's the reason it's iron free, excuse me, iron free, but also uh, cold water. So that water is 56 degrees Fahrenheit all the time. Being an underground spring system, you got that same cool temperature. Back in Jack's day, this would have been his cooling system. That was refrigeration. So when Jack heard about it, he said, that's as good as it gets. Let's move up there and make whiskey. And then eventually, years down the road, we became nationwide household kind of whiskey making status. And with that, they said, well, they expect Jack to taste a certain way. If we change our location, we change our product because if we change our location, we're not using the same water to make the whiskey anymore. So it's the same story with whiskeys, beers, bagels, pizza doughs, all sorts of different food and beverage brands. But every drop of Jack in the world only comes from this one site because every drop starts with the water coming out of that spring. So Jack would have started building this in the late 1880s and until the mid 1950s this was HQ right here. So the history of this building is off the chart. But going from this one, Jack Daniel. Tejeros, si sacan el whisky del estado y lo ponen a añejar en otro lugar, se considera como un blended whisky, no como single malt, lo que sería en el scotch. You drop off the corn barley rye, you mill it down to a flour right there, and then at the, after the grain mill does its job, you add the water from the spring, that creates mash, and then down here on the bottom floor of the still house is where you cook it. So when you cook it, you're going to convert starch down to sugar. When you ferment it, that's going to convert sugar to alcohol. So the fermentation is on the back side, and that's where the yeast comes in and the yeast is the second most important part about the flavor of a whiskey so Jack does have its own proprietary yeast culture that we propagate on location as well so the yeast does the job of making beer you're making what's called distiller's beer it's beer minus hops and corn base so it's not a beer you're making to drink it's a beer you're making to make distilled spirit out of so what we call moonshine so that's what this job is right here so the beer usually takes about four days to finish out. You start building your alcohol and flavor from that. And then distillation. You turn beer into raw distilled alcohol. So these are column stills these days. Back in the early days, we'd have had the typical pot still, been very small. But by the 1940s, we went column. So these things are 40 foot tall. They're 100% copper. Now about every two feet, there's a large copper tray. It's almost like a large flat copper colander, almost like a spaghetti strainer. So the beer is going to go up over the top of the column, fall down through those copper trays. You're going to heat it with steam. And as it drops down through that 40 feet, you're going to be able to boil the alcohol content off as a vapor. The alcohol vapor goes back to the top. Then that carries way through copper piping to start cooling down. And once you cool down a vapor to a liquid, in our case, it looks like water. But trust me, it is not. At that point, that's 70% ethanol. So what people want to call 140 proof, white lightning, wildcat, white dog, whatever you want to call it. Gold 27 can come from anywhere in the barrel house because it comes out of the first barrel as black label and then the maple barrel after that. So keep that in mind. It's kind of weird how it all works out. Kind of very different products from similar kind of production. 
But uh, pick up Goal 27 and smell it. And when you smell it, open your mouth a little bit. You're not just breathing through your nose. It's going through your mouth to your nose. And then also they compare make, the smell make. of the Gold 27 to the smell of Sinatra. Because we're actually going to stay just in the first two. We're not going to go to the single barrel family until here in a few minutes. Because I'm going to compare the first two side by side for you to really get you understanding what they're all about. Also, once we start sipping these things, the first few sips of whiskey are very weird. It's basically it's just, it's just whiskey. You can't truly taste whiskey until about four sips in on the first sample or if it's your first drink of the night. So what I'd love if you try, no demand, just a suggestion. I would take three sips of Gold 27, leave enough to come back to, to taste one more little sip. But after the first three sips, to leave some, I want you to move into Sinatra. We'll work on Sinatra, then we'll go back to Gold. And it will not taste the same. So pick up Gold 27 then, smell it again. Smell is your number one tasting tool. And then, very tiny volume, because we don't have much we can give you. Let that little bit of whiskey sit on the tip of the tongue for about two or three seconds. Roll it around, kind of chew on it, smack on it a little bit, swallow it down. So we're exaggerating this because we're not going to give you more than a shot within the time we're together. We're not going to get you drinking too much liquor and then getting in your car. Uh, but we want you to get a little taste of each one. And if you just breeze through the first one, you'll miss out on it. Trust me. <coughs> so three sips of it, but leave a little bit to come back to it. So after the gold, three sips, jump right into Sinatra. Go back to gold. And I will not say that you're going to like gold 27 better when you go back to it, but I will say this. I'll hang my hat on it. Gold 27 will taste like a different whiskey when you go back to it after you drink Sinatra. It will not taste like it did the first three sips. So Sinatra's the bold. You want to drink Sinatra Select if you're a bold whiskey fan. It's got more character to it. It's got more finish to it. It's going to hang out more back here. Gold 27 is the one you want to drink if you're more the mellow, kind of refined whiskey fan. Gold 27 is super soft, super pleasant. So the, the Sinatra is coming from the contact in the barrel. Yeah, yeah, right, surface right? area. The surface so, area. So what we're doing with this cut is kind of twofold. When you cut it like this, you've actually now got a depth to it where you created these little notches. And believe it or not, just adding that little notch to it is going to increase surface area. Plus all the stuff that you cut out of there that you run the router and get that out. That's still in there, so it's still doing its job. A lot of people picture that we like do this and then throw away all the stuff we take out. The stuff we take out is still in the barrel. It's the wood that makes it good, as they say, right? So you're nearly doubling the surface area this way, but you're also exposing the wood. And so if you got this one, you got that whole char layer to go through. I've been told it takes pretty much four, uh, almost four seasons to really penetrate that char on that first year. It takes a while. But with this one, you don't have to penetrate the char. You're going straight to the wood, but you're also getting char exposure as well. So it's going to change things a little bit. When we made Sinatra, what you should taste, what we want you to taste, is a whiskey that's automatically, undeniably a Jack Daniels product. But it's going to have its own thing. If you set it against Black Label, it's going to drink a little sweeter for longer. It's going to have a little more character to it. But it's still a Jack product through and through. So if you blindfolded people, hopefully that's what they would say. They'd be like, yep, this is Jack, but something's different. Because Frank was independent. Frank was unique, as he said, out of my way. But Frank drank black leather. So, Fun fact for trivia, if I did not mention, Frank Sinatra was buried with, buried with a bottle of old number seven Jack. Really? Mm -hmm. True story, man. If you see Frank ever in a photograph after 1950 holding a whiskey, it's, it's Jack. Did you pay, well, Jack Daniels pay something to him or he just well, this it. was this was posthumous actually his family asked for this so like when frank was alive we didn't pay frank a cent uh we we don't pay or endorse with celebrities ever it's not okay. our thing uh but with the sinatra foundation they requested this so sinatra's family runs a foundation leads for charity work so his daughter tina came to us and said well y'all do this for us it was a very interesting move we had never put anybody's name on a bottle of Jack Daniels other than Jack Daniels employees until Mr. Frank Sinatra. Because they sat and thought and said, well, they want it, let's do it, let's do it. So after 140 plus years of making Jack, he was the first non-employee to ever have his name on a bottle of Jack. And that was big. And so with their money like coming off profits and stuff, I think if not all of it, the majority of it's going to be work through the foundation. And it works out pretty, uh, pretty well that way. But I guess that was 2015, maybe. I, and they made what they called the Sensory Select. So it was, a, it was 100 proof, 100 barrels of it. 
and in a different kind of packaging. People bought that for about five to $600 a bottle retail. Within probably a year, most people, you couldn't get it for any less than a thousand. And then the single barrel group. So this stuff is the stuff that all changes flavor profile when it comes out of a new barrel. So those cards, not to disrespect them, they're not correct because you can't switch the cards for every single barrel that we get through this place. Yeah. So that's a general idea of what you might taste. The single barrel thing is, it tastes different every time. So if you want to buy a bottle of it, it's kind of a gamble. I always like it. I describe it to people like it's a strike zone in baseball. So you've always got it in the zone, but it's always a little bit different. Some people, they don't agree. But if you want to buy this from bottle to bottle, we put a, a label on the neck by hand on about 250 bottles. Uh, every barrel, it totals up to about 10,000 bottles in eight hours. We're hand labeling this right here, even at a big name like Jack. And that label tells you the ID of the barrel, which tells you, if I buy that number again, I've got the same whiskey in that bottle. But you're only going to get about 250 bottles from one barrel with that same number. So with that, it goes pretty quick. You can sometimes find it again, sometimes not. You skip the middleman. Anything single barrel bottle, you don't have to buy a bottle at a time. You can buy a barrel at a time. If you want to pay, it's about ten to twelve thousand dollars. So <laughs> what you'll do is get three samples of the of the single barrel product. So three different barrels. Pick your favorite barrel. We bottle it for you. We put your name around the bottles with a medallion around the neck. Has your name on it. And we sell, uh, last time I heard, about a thousand a year like that now. We're talking families, groups of friends, individuals, celebrities, civic organizations, companies, uh, clubs, uh, sports teams, all sorts of folks. If you add them all together, the United States military has bought the most. <laughs> and platoons, graduating classes from academies, uh, officer clubs, stuff like that. So your single barrel select that we first came out with, 94 proof, so 47%. Your single barrel select that we came out with after that, barrel proof. So the difference between number three and number four is the alcohol volume, and that's it. So they're both select, they're both single barrel, but there's a very different alcohol content. So when this comes out of a barrel, what we're gonna do is uh, run it through a filter. We're gonna take out the char and stuff that you'd be eating on otherwise, and then we put this stuff into a bottle and we put it on the shelf. So when you're drinking barrel proof, first off, there's no lowering to the alcohol volume from a barrel, so it's going to be high. Secondly, there's no standardization to the alcohol percentage, so it's always going to be a different number. So this label down here is the alcohol volume label. That's also put on by hand on the single barrel uh, barrel proof product. So 170 to 180 bottles are going to taste and look the same and have the same number, but then the next ones will not. So down here, for instance, your display is not what matches your actual sample. But your display is 130.6. What you're drinking is 134.7. So you're going from a 65.3% to a 67.35%. Barrel proof, so different world. But notice the color change, a lot darker. The flavor change is gonna be there. It's gonna have more flavor to it. The smell will change. And it just kind of depends on what kind of whiskey drink you are in. Uh, some whiskey drinkers have more experience and kind of can get used to it better than others. And then some people surprise me. Uh, I had two girls sitting where we are sitting about three months ago. They were not whiskey drinkers at all. They were here with their family and their dad was a whiskey drinker. Their dad didn't like barrel proof. They were the only two in the room that liked barrel proof out of the whole group. And everybody was shocked because they said they don't even drink whiskey. Uh, and they said, and they were like, why do you like that one? Because everybody else was like, I don't care for it. But they said it's the one that had the most flavor to it. They said that's the one they tasted a lot of flavor to. Well, that is true because it's a straight flavor. Exactly. It's got, it's got more flavor than anything we put on the show. Barrel proof is bigger. Yeah. All the caramels from the mm -hmm. old. Heavier yeah. sweet. One more spice. It's a little more. It's a little more. See, I Pepper. prefer the 94 proof myself, but it'll surprise you sometimes who is a barrel proof fan. It's, uh, it's different. But it's hot for sure. You can basically track it as it goes down to the chest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but as a sipping whiskey goes, it's like, okay, I could actually maybe get into this. Yeah, yeah, do a little ice cream. But barrel proof, I'll be honest with you, is made to stick on you in every sort of way. So you're going to be getting a little bit of an effect from it, kind of messing with your number five sample. So the rye is single barrel, the rye is select, but it's a rye version instead of a corn version. It's just like switching your ingredients for making bread. If I gave you a cornbread and a rye bread, 
very different. If I give you a corn whiskey and a rye whiskey, very different. So most people describe the rye as more peppery, almost anise-like in a way. So a lot of folks that like licorice or like uh, black, je black jelly beans are big rye fans in the whiskey world. I'm not rye fan, but this is good. It's, it's very different for rye because first off, I mean, we change the <coughs> ratios a lot. Most rye whiskey that people drink is going to be either just enough to be a rye, which is 51% to 55%, or they're going to go super heavy rye, and they're going to do like 90 to 95% rye grain. We wanted to shoot the middle to say, okay, here's the flavor from rye, but let's not go too crazy with it. So it's 70%. And then also, I mean, Jack makes it, so we, we treat it like we treat every other whiskey we make. So it's actually the same yeast culture, it's the same charcoal method, it's the same barrel method, it's, a, it's just a Jack version of it. So it's a rye, but it's a Jack rye. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, some distilleries, especially, well, the bourbon ones, you can become kind of ambassador of them, and yeah. they can put your name in the barrel, you know, for age and... <laughs> You can come to the distillery and just release your batch. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So is Jack Daniels doing the same thing or I something? I mean, you can get your, closer? with the single barrel program, buying your barrel, get your name on the plaques, get your name on everything. Uh, as far as that goes, though, not really. We have a program called the Squire Association, which are basic, that's basically our brand ambassador program that are not employees, so <coughs> worldwide Jack Daniels fans. So we use that as well. That's kind of similar in a, in a way. Amigos, hay un par de lugares donde no te dejan grabar y es donde está, bueno, pues ese goteo sobre goteo, que es el charco y es el lugar donde no te metes, donde tienen toda la mezcla o el mash, donde tienen las tinas grandes de pues, toda su combinación que hacen de granos, eso tampoco no, no te meten al, al tú. Una de las cosas, pues el Jack Gentleman tiene dos veces ese filtrado entre el, el charco que lo, no lo tiene la etiqueta normal, la etiqueta número 7. Esa es la diferencia con el Gentleman Jack. Y con el Single Barrel, pues ese no tiene el doble filtrado, pero pues cada sabor es único. Abren barrica tras barrica y cada barrica pues es única su sabor. Una de las etiquetas también que tienen aquí es Sinatra, algo que estaban bueno, diciendo también dentro de, esas, de ese tiempo en el que no pude grabar. Es que Sinatra los hizo muy famosos a ellos porque tomaba Jack Daniels. Esa época donde Sinatra era el más famoso de Estados Unidos, en los 50s, en los 60s, lo único que tomaba Sinatra era Jack Daniels. Entonces todo eso pues le dio el nombre y empezaron a vender como bestias estos cuates. Bueno amigos, y también algo pues, a estos cuates los compraron los mismos que compraron a Tequila Herradura, son del mismo grupo ahora. Hicieron mucho dinero cuando compraron a Jack Daniels estos cuates y fueron como hicieron todo este grupo. Están en Louisville, Kentucky. Los vamos a visitar después. También vamos a visitar todas las estilerías de Bourbon. Aquí vamos a ver el Bourbon Trail. Aquí va a estar el video aquí arriba. Tengo una botella ya con mi nombre. En fin, esto es todo. Nos despedimos desde la estilería Jack Daniels. Si les ha gustado el video, den un like. Compartan con algún amigo para poder seguir creciendo. Y síganos porque vamos a visitar muchas estilerías de Bourbon Whisky también. Yo soy Luis, esto es Mochilazo. Viajeros, como siempre, muchas gracias por ver este video. Si no se han suscrito, suscríbanse al canal, den un like si les ha gustado y compartan con los viajeros a quienes pueda servir esta información.